In last week's video, we covered the first five of the 10 key modern data components. And in this video, we're gonna cover the next five, what I call the advanced section. So if you haven't watched that first video, I recommend starting with that. But with that said, we're gonna dive right back in and finish this up with the last five advanced components. So whether you watch it or not, just to recap and get us all on the same page, the last video we covered what I called the essentials. And these include storage and databases. You have to be able to put data somewhere. Ingestion. How does it get there? How are you actually loading your data and moving it into the storage locations? Three is transformation. And this is how are you adding a business logic, formatting it, modeling it, all that stuff. Four is visualization, or I might've referred to this as reporting and analytics, really how are you interacting with this data? How's the business actually using it? Number five is version control and CICD, which is continuous integration and continuous deployment. And this has a lot to do with your workflow, keeping things transparent, automating your deployments. And so those to me, are the foundations of any solid data architecture in today's world. There are obviously way more things that we can do and that's what we're covering today. But if you're looking to get started, cut through the noise, make sure you have these in place first before moving on because otherwise you're probably overcomplicating it too soon in my opinion. With that said, let's now jump to the advanced section and talk about the next components that you can add. So the first one we're gonna talk about is orchestration. And I will say this one is kind of on the border of whether or not this is an essential or not. And these are most commonly nowadays, separate tools or separate functionality to automate and glue your whole process together. And this is really helpful because without a central orchestrator of some sort, your process can become hard to manage and feel a little bit overwhelming. You have different things happening at different parts. You can sometimes lose that control over what's happening or the visibility. And that's why I have here it also helps you monitor and control things at a higher level. And in a central location, you can think of it like a control plane, you're seeing all these different components that are going on. The reason I have this as an advanced component rather than in the essentials is because I believe you can handle a lot of the orchestration initially through something like a version control platform, you can just have a simple cron job built into that, that will run things on a schedule and you might have some things running at different times. So you might have your data ingestion, your data transformation, and maybe a data refresh running at different times. And that is not necessarily ideal long term, and which is why you want to start to look at having an orchestrator. But the point is to get started for a lot of companies, you don't need to get to this right away. Once you have all that other stuff established, even if they're running at different times, you can still usually manage it for a while in that state. I think an orchestrator is a great next step to put it all together, but it does add a little bit of complexity. And in this visual here, I have this outside because it does touch everything, but I just have it as an icon here. The idea is it sits on top of it. It's your control plane, it's your orchestrator. And that is the number six of the 10 modern data components. All right, number seven is containers. And containers are something that you don't necessarily need right away, but I think a lot of teams end up going that route for a variety of different reasons. And essentially a container is an isolated virtual instance of an operating system that can be used to run applications and processes. It sits on top of your actual hardware and creates this kind of safe separate place to run stuff, which is really cool. The most common tool by far is Docker. So how's it implemented? It's good for specific runtime environments. Sometimes people will automatically spin up a container and run a process in a very clean, specific environment through a container. And then it shuts down and goes away when that process is done. You can also use it to host open source tools. For example, you could host a data visualization tool or even a whole database in a container, in a separate environment and just let it be there. Pretty cool, there's a lot of networking things involved. You can create development environments if you want. Everybody on your team could have individual containerized environments. Why is this helpful? This allows you to create very specific custom types of environments for whatever it is you wanna do without the overhead of creating entirely new machines. That's what makes it really powerful. It's sitting on top of the hardware that you have. It creates these virtual containerized locations. If this is something that's new to you, I recommend watching some other videos on that. This is not a tutorial or a deep dive into containers, but I mentioned them here because they are something you're gonna run into. It's more of a, an infrastructure type of thing that you can leverage as an engineer, as part of an architecture. And for some teams, they never use containers at all. And that's totally fine. They're able to be successful with their operations. And then others rely very heavily on it. And it's a huge part of the team of the way it works. So moving on to number eight is infrastructure as code, or you might see the abbreviation IAC. So this is something that becomes really powerful and really scalable once you start working more deeply with cloud-based infrastructure. So a lot of these tools, for example, Terraform is a very popular one, allows you to encode, establish the configurations for a wide variety of different cloud-based services. Maybe you wanna create a database, maybe you wanna create a network, maybe you wanna create a virtual machine or create 
database users, database schemas, and set permissions. There's so many different things you can do for all these different cloud-based tools, and you can do it through code. And what's helpful about it being in code, processes and included as part of a deployment so everybody knows what's going on. And this is rather than what typically happens, which is manually. So imagine rather than having to go through the steps of manually picking the dropdowns, putting in the name, putting in the settings for all these different services, you can just have it in code and click go. So how is this typically implemented? A lot of times it's for automating deployments, updates, onboarding. So if you're a new user and you want to be added to a group, a lot of times it's just adding you to some Terraform code, click and go, and you'll be automatically added to whatever it is, whether it's a database or just permissions to access a different cloud tool. It's helpful for managing roles and permissions. We mentioned all that often written in YAML or JSON. Why is this helpful? We already mentioned it reduces manual steps, provides transparency. And this is actually very important. I should have mentioned this before. The transparency is a big one because a lot of times, at least in the past, what would happen is when it comes to managing infrastructure, there might be one person who has admin privileges who just rogue goes and changes permissions for somebody or adds a user, or you have to send in a request to somebody to do this. And there's no trail of what happened. They just went in, added somebody or changed their password or whatever. But now with things set as code, there's transparency on exactly the state of what is deployed. And assuming you're following good practices, somebody's not going to come in there and update that without somebody else knowing. And if you combine this with, here we go up here with version control and CICD, you have that process established. It helps avoid some one person being responsible for all these things. It can be part of an overall pipeline that runs on a cadence, or you just manually trigger these updates. So we mentioned ensures consistency, transparency, reduces manual steps really a great feature to have. But again, to reiterate here, this is not something that I feel is required to start. It's something that comes later as you get more advanced, as you have your foundation set. This is something to consider adding if and only if you need it. All right, number nine is data quality. And I probably should have renamed this actually because it's not the idea that quality itself should be lower in the list. If anything, it should be higher. It should be one of the most important things. But the idea of this section is the separate data quality and data governance types of tools. They're more add-ons to your process more than something foundational, in my opinion, because there are other ways you can manage it before getting to this point. Hopefully that makes sense. But the goal here, it's still very helpful. It helps ensure data accuracy, completeness, consistency, reliability. So how are these concepts implemented? Well, you can automate testing at various steps you can use linters and automations, documentation and lineage. There are data catalogs to organize all the metadata. And this is something I think with AI is getting more and more robust and becoming a little easier to implement because you can understand the context of your code. It could probably spit out documentation by itself without you needing to do it. Testing will become more thorough. Each of these tools and all these different things are adding more functionality to improve data quality. So sometimes it's already built into the tool. So for example, DBT has tests, but they also have more things more recently released like the catalogs and the automated CI checks and understanding what data has changed. Things like that are already included a lot of times, but I still mention it here anyway. Here are some other tools. So you have great expectations, you have SQL fluff, and linters are ways to check your code, basically automatically check that your code is following certain syntax, that you're staying consistent with your coding principles, data catalog tools, data observability tools, and all this stuff. It's the goal is to help catch errors and improve consistency and just have more awareness and transparency on what the code is that you're built. You've built this whole pipeline. You're running all these processes. What the heck is even going on? How do you make sure that it's going well? These are a lot of tools here that can help with that. So again, I hope that makes sense. And when I say data quality, I'm talking more of those add on tools, not saying you should never care about data quality before, but it's those additional things that you can add once you have the foundations in place. Now, wrapping things up, Number 10 is a concept called reverse ETL. And this is something that is relatively newer, I think, to the data landscape and is something that I would say most teams don't need to worry about for a while, but it is a concept to be familiar with because at some point there are absolutely use cases for this. And this is something that has seen more investment over the last few years. Reverse ETL, if you're not familiar, is the idea of sending data that you've put through your data pipeline, it's transformed, it's cleaned up at the end, but you actually wanna bring it back into your business application. So a very simple example of this could be your CRM. Maybe you're using Salesforce and you have some custom fields in Salesforce that you want to populate based on your transform data. And this historically can be a little bit of a goofy process to get it back in, a lot of customization. But what these tools help to do is make the interface really simple to use and the process easy to set up and you can add it as part of your whole pipeline that it'll take data from a 
particular model that you create and automatically sync it with that business app. For many teams, you may not have a need for this right away or for a while, but when you do get to that point, reverse ETL is the name of that process and it's sending it backwards. It's going back in reverse, but only after it's gone through this process. So it's a little bit of a niche thing here. It's often implemented at the end, in my mind, of the data pipeline, sending it back to business applications. And we mentioned why this is helpful. It helps business users stay in the tools they know. So maybe it's the CRM, maybe it's some other tool, but you're still providing the business approved custom fields. So the alternative here is one of two things. Number one is they might try to recreate some custom logic. And now you have the business user creating logic and you have the data team creating logic and it's a mismatch. So this allows you to sync them back together and basically have it as the same value. And number two, it helps them stay in the applications that they like the tools that they want. Maybe they're very familiar with their CRM, maybe it's Salesforce or something like that. And as opposed to forcing these users to go to a reporting tool to run their reports to figure out what they need, to instead send that data back to their business applications and they can create their own reports, but they're using the same data that you've created. So it just helps avoid friction in that process. And on that same note, it avoids the need for extra custom reports because a lot of times people will want custom things to fit the need of what they're trying to do here but the company or the team is forcing everybody to use a data visualization tool. There's a lot of customization that needs to happen in order to match exactly what's in the business app. But if you can instead just send that data back to them, let them stay in that tool, you can a lot of times manage that relationship in a different way. Here are a few of the example tools that cover that process. And again, this is something I would consider in advance, nice to have component that's good to be aware of and something that you might run into as you go about your journey in data engineering. We've now wrapped up the 10 key modern data components. If this is a document you want to have as well as a resource, I'll leave a link below. You can download it for free and hopefully help simplify this crazy world of data so that you can get in front of you the really what's important, what I consider the essentials, along with some of these other more advanced concepts that you can add on to or learn about later once you establish them. So to recap the advanced section here, we had orchestration, which is scheduling and really having that high level control plane. We have containers, which are the isolated environments for a variety of different purposes, Docker being the main tool there. Infrastructure as code, which allows you to automate, be more transparent with how your cloud tools are being managed and provisioned. Data quality, which in this case means additional add-on data quality tools for lineage, observability, governance, stuff like that to really round out and put a bow around your architecture. And last but not least is reverse ETL, which is syncing your well-structured data back into the business apps to make sure that everyone's on the same page. You don't overly customize that process and everybody can hopefully win and be most effective. So I hope you found both this video and the original one on the essentials helpful. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you at the next video.